am delighted to say that I am joined by Lionel Sanders, recent two times winner of the Challenge Championship and probably pretty famous for his indoor training. Now, Lionel, thanks for joining us and I'm going to be picking your brains on how you train indoors and basically if you've got any tips for our viewers. So start off, if you can tell me why you do so much of your training indoors and how that kind of came about when you started triathlon. Sure, yeah. It was For the most part, uh, it came to me. Uh, I got hit by cars four times in four years, one of which I woke up in the back of an ambulance, strapped to the board, front teeth knocked out, couldn't remember who I was, the whole thing. And then uh, I was like, uh, is it worth it? Do I really want to die on my bicycle? Well, not so much by getting hit by cars, perhaps from pushing myself to the limit, but not, uh, not from the cars. Um, and so that's how I discovered indoor training. And then when I got onto the trainer, it was on, it was on the bike, obviously, and uh, I realized, wow, this actually is, is just as good, if not better, than training outside. There's no stop signs, there's no cars, there's no anything to distract me. Uh, I can just focus on pushing big power. I can control every piece of the puzzle. I can control the rest, the, the recovery, or the interval duration, everything. Don't have to worry about anything. And, uh, and so that's why I, I got into it. Uh, and then I started to think, well, I wonder if it's the same for the running. And then I got onto the treadmill and I realized, wow, it's the exact same thing as well. It's just always perfect. And in fact, uh, in the treadmill's case, it's almost like having a training partner with you too because you, I used to put my treadmill backed into the wall and you put it up to 12 miles an hour. Your incentive to run at 12 miles an hour is that if you don't, you're going to slam into that wall and perhaps die. So um, it was a good training partner too. So when I discovered all of this, that's when I really started to gravitate towards it. And, um, actually became quite difficult to go outside. A lot of people ask me, uh, you know, aren't you bored and all these things? I'm like, no, it's the opposite, actually. It's just so convenient. Uh, I can control every variable. And, and so, yeah, at times it, I have to force myself to go back outside to get back into outdoor things. Well, that's kind of brought me onto that. And how do you make sure that it's, you know, because obviously you, you only race outdoors. Well, you've done a couple of races indoors. Yeah, but. not true, actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, most of your triathlons, the important sure. ones, yeah. are outdoors. And how do you make sure that what you're doing indoors correlates exactly enough to outdoor racing? Yeah, that's the beauty of the power meter on the bike anyway, is power is power. So whatever, I, in fact, I've come to find due to the cooling effect, uh, whatever I'm pushing inside, Usually when I go outside, I can push 15 to 20 watts more. So it's actually kind of uh, almost like training in your big bulky runners and then putting your racing flats on, same sort of bump you get when you go outside. So, but power is power. So uh, if you're pushing 300 watts on the trainer, well, you, there's no reason why you can't just go and push 300 watts or more outside. So um, there's really nothing to, to think about there uh, from that standpoint. On the treadmill, on the other hand, um, I mean, you certainly can utilize things like the stride power meter, um, the Garmin, the little uh, the foot pod things. Um, so, and I, and I have used those sorts of things just to get a sense of, because I have two treadmills, to get a sense of the difference between the two. And then heart rate as well is a great uh, metric to, to gauge, you know, let's say on my one treadmill, put it at 11 miles an hour, for instance, maybe my heart rate will be 125. And I'll go onto the other treadmill, my heart rate will only be 122. So obviously the two treadmills are not the exact same, but it doesn't really matter for the most part. I mean, now that I've been doing this a long time, a lot of my, uh, I guess, training is for the most part by feel, actually, uh, now that I know sort of the zones and what they feel like. Uh, and I just, I, for the most part, try and get inside of those zones and I know how they feel, so I just adjust the treadmill based on based on that. And does that feel, I know you said that, you know, the cooling effect outdoors, it makes it feel a bit easier, but can you correlate, do you know, if you're not looking at your power meter on the bike, do you know roughly how hard you're working when you're outside? Because there's so many other factors going on and there's wind and there's weather, there's slopes, there's other people. Yeah. Are you able to still correlate that in your mind very easily? Yeah, for the most part, I think at, at constant wattage, at 300 watts, for instance, it's harder inside. So when you go outside, you're always like, oh, pleasantly surprised at how easy 300 watts feels. For, the, for instance, uh, Ironman Arizona two years ago, I was doing my, my intervals, I believe, at 320 watts. Two times one hour was my peak workout at one, 320 watts. And then I got into the race and I pushed 320 watts for the first three hours. 
it wasn't that challenging. Whereas in, on the trainer, it was quite challenging to do two times an hour. So I had actually went into the race thinking, oh, I'll probably be somewhere between 300 and 310 for the average. And I ended up averaging 318 for the whole ride. So uh, it's actually one of the, I, I believe one of the benefits of the indoor training is you do get a kind of a bump when you go outside. And I believe it's predominantly due to full body cooling. Like if you've ever, uh, put a fan full tilt, a big fan full tilt. That's like riding at like 25 kilometers an hour. You know what I mean? Like you need like some massive fans to create the cooling, full body cooling effect of 40 plus kilometer an hour riding. And I actually, a guy did it for me one time in a in a sweat test. Said that's about 40 kilometers an hour. And I had to wear sunglasses and stuff on the indoor trainer because my eyes were like dried, completely dried. I couldn't blink. Uh, but that's just the amazing part of when you're actually moving uh, the difference. Well, that brings me on to your actual setup. And we've seen uh, glimpses on your social media and things, but what does your setup look like? And do you have a fan? What do you have, um, what do you have to hand around you? Um, yeah, what's, what's it look like? Yeah, I got uh, the Wahoo kicker and the, the nice table and everything. And then I've got my, my iPad uh, set up on Zwift. Um, then I've got multiple different fans I'll use for different types of workouts. I bring out the big painter's fan when I'm doing a real high, uh, high end VO2 max, long continuous kind of interval. Um, and then on the treadmill, same, same deal. I've got the nice Woodway treadmill. Um, I usually, actually the Woodway, the beauty of the Woodway is that it's Bluetooth. So I just pair the treadmill to Zwift to utilize that. Uh, my other treadmill, on the other hand, inside the, the energy lab room that, that we created, it's got a sauna, it's insulated inside, got the heaters, uh, infrared heat lamp, etc. That one I'll use the foot pod because it's not Bluetooth, but uh, I still use Zwift and all that sort of thing when and I'm training that, in there. And is that purely set up that treadmill for Kona? Esque conditions. That's 100%. 100%. Uh, literally, it's called the Energy Lab for approximately mile 17 to 26 in Kona. We create. You have to create a room to prepare properly for that. Uh, those conditions and, and the mental uh, capacity required to do well, uh, which didn't work that well actually. It didn't. Didn't. The, the training uh, didn't get me the, all the way I needed to go this year. But uh, maybe a few more sessions in the in the room will help next year. We'll and see. Do you ever ride your bike without a fan on the turbo? I never ride my bike without a fan. It's just not. Uh, I find the perceived exertion. Actually, this is a funny story. We were in uh, Pukan 70.3. And I didn't have a fan, and it was like we were on the top floor of the hotel, and there was no air conditioning. It was like literally 90 degrees in there, at least with very high humidity. And I was doing, I was, I intended to do a, an interval workout, and I literally was warming up at like 250 to 280 watts. It's like my easy pace, and my heart rate was 100, getting into 140s, which for me is like high-end threshold heart rate. And I sit there and I was like, I literally cannot do a workout. There's just no way, but I need to get some, some intensity in my legs for the race. So I said, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you take my wheel bag and fan me with the wheel bag for half an hour. <laughs> and oh she gosh. took me up on the offer. Wow. I still haven't paid her the hundred bucks. Really? Wow. And a, a lot of people often ask and, and complain about the problems on their bikes of you know the salt and affecting the you know rusting and things like that. Is there oh, anything? Yeah. What do you do to your bike to sort of? Yeah, it? I actually because uh, I used to race and train on the same bike, and uh, I got to a race. It was Ironman Arizona actually a couple years ago, and literally I pressed the brakes and springs snapped on the brakes in, inside the brake mechanism because they were so rusted out. And, uh, and so that's when I said, uh, maybe you shouldn't race and train on the same bike. And so that's what I recommend if you're doing, like I literally was doing every single ride yeah. on the trainer. So they do make a few little things, covers and stuff. I mean, if, if, you, can't, if you can't do that, then definitely, you definitely want to be putting towel and, and they do make a couple different covers to put over your brake and housing and all that stuff. Uh, but I'd highly recommend maybe training on it and racing on different bikes. Yeah. And, and talking of the, the different bikes and going back to preparing for race day. And I know you, had, you know, talked about it feeling a bit easier when you actually get outside. But is there anything you do and how much outdoor training do you do before a race to actually get that live feeling and to make sure you've got the bike handling skills? And I know you've yeah. talked about bike handling after Oceanside, was it? Um, and, you know, the, yeah. maybe you need to work on that as well. It's like anything. You drink too much water, you'll die. You do anything too much, it's probably not good for you. And so I do really believe in indoor training, but 
you got to ride your bike too. You got to handle your bike. And so uh, I've definitely curbed it back a little. I've been going outside. And in fact, I think you should probably go outside, not for your workouts, but for your easy stuff and do it on, find really technical places. So I have this uh, like f walking paths, you know, really windy. Uh, it's like five kilometers in each direction. Um, I mean, I'm confined to where I live. We don't really have any mountains or anything, you know what I mean? I, if, I, if I had some mountains, I'd certainly be going up into the mountains and coming back down. Uh, but you make do with what you have, so that's how I'm going about it. Are we going to see you racing Xterra anytime soon? Absolutely not. No, I mean I'm looking to live to see the next day. So yeah. When you when you um, trained before Zwift came along, how did you mentally sort of stop yourself getting bored? How did you keep focused? I didn't. I just got really bored, and eventually I came to the conclusion that uh, you know it's all in the mind. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of time to do some introspection. And uh, I came to a lot of the realizations about my current race, uh, how I go about racing in those moments when I would just stare at the wall and, uh, and, and just be with the, with the intensity and be with the movement. And uh, I mean, it, that's also quite enjoyable too. Sometimes I just ride the trainer without any stimulation because it is, sometimes you need that. You need just a moving meditation. And uh, yeah, I mean, once again, too much of anything is not good. Yeah. It's good to be a well-rounded athlete. So doing everything you can see and think of, it's all good for you. Doing one is not going to be good for you. Do do it all. And so you do your own mental training, and you let your mind go sometimes when you're, or you're always bringing your mind back. Yeah. Once again, too much of anything is not good. So sometimes you allow your mind to wander, and other times, especially times when you have anxiety and those sorts of things, it's better to come back to to center and allow those anxieties to fade away and then, then you put those anxiety into perspective and then you probably come back to, when you've done the exercise, to whatever the issue is, you have a much better perspective because you're not attached to the, to the anxiety. So uh, it's all good, it's all, and, and you definitely should say, sometimes I'm gonna stay totally focused in on this workout and other times you can allow yourself to check out a little bit. Uh, it's all good for you and, and uh, ways to become a better athlete and a better person, I believe. And I mean, you've mentioned Zwift a few times and now it's you're moving more into triathlon as well with the Zwift Academy. What are your thoughts on that and why tri and you know, triathlon, do you think triathlon's moving more into more indoor training and is that gonna help the sport or how do you well, see that? Well, time is such a, an issue when you're doing three sports. So the beauty of the, of the indoor training is there's not like the, the bike's already set up, ready to go. You just flick the fan on, pair the thing onto the onto Swift or whatever, and uh, you're you're ready to go. There's no airing the tires up, getting to the proper roads, driving whatever, all this stuff. So so from a convenience factor, it's fantastic, which is the name of the game in triathlon, and then Swift as well. For me anyway, uh, I mean I like riding on Swift a lot more than staring at the wall. So I'm always a uh, big believer in uh, the best time, or you get really good at bike when you're riding your bike. So whatever motivates you to ride your bike, you should do that. And being on Zwift, being in races, being with people motivates me to get onto the bike. So, so you should do that. Uh, so I think it's really good. And I think uh, I certainly have seen a lot more people going towards it. And then I think a lot of people are also coming to the co conclusion that the training quality for most people is better indoors on these virtual roads with no cars and no distractions and actually stimulus that uh, increases your intensity, increases your engagement to your riding, um, it's better on there than it is out in their whatever roads with all these cars and everything. So, so yeah, I think we'll, we'll just continue on down that pathway. Yeah. And then imagine the day when we get the VR goggles and everything, which I'm sure is not that far down the road, and you literally will look over to the left in the race and dude's right next to you. I mean, that's coming. Do you think there's a certain personality type that can get more out of indoor training than, than others? Do you think you need to have a certain, like, mindset to be able to train indoors? Well, I, I think I'm always, I believe this is 90% uh, mental, 10% physical for the most part, this whole endeavor. Yeah. And so if you label yourself as, oh, I'm a person who can't ride indoors, well, there's something to improve upon. 
and same for myself, who was a person who was good at riding indoors. Well, I need to get outside sometimes too, right? This is all becoming well-rounded. There should be no such thing as, uh, this is not ideal for me, right? That's just a mental block that you've created for yourself. And so anytime you ever find one, that's a great gift because it's an area to improve upon. And so for me, the big one right now is technical things. And so I'm getting rid of that. I'm, I'm gonna become a good technical rider so that there is no, there are no courses that I can't do. I'll do all the courses. I don't avoid courses. Uh, and that's only going to help when you do go to your courses that are built for you. You're just going to become even more confident, more proficient. Uh, so, so no, there is no... Well, yeah, there is, but they created that themselves. Yeah, yeah. And do you have... Uh, could you give us an example of your, one of your favorite sessions to do on the indoor trainer? Sure, yeah. I, um, I mean, I use the trainer in so many different ways as I've gotten, gotten to, to know it. Some sessions I just want to do a straight, I'll put it into erg mode, and I'll just do like straight, let's say 10 times eight minutes, that's like a nice 70.3 session, 10 times eight minutes with three minutes recovery, and I'll put it right to the exact wattage that I want, I'll just hold it dead steady. That's a perfect session for a race like Challenge Sam Lawrence, dead flat, no hills, very little corners. You just gotta be able to stay in the time trial position and hold good power. So for that workout, I put the, I put the wattage at like 350 to 360 watts, and it's just, that's what you're doing for the next 80 minutes, basically, is holding it dead steady and trying to hold good technique. On the other hand, you can put the trainer on to, for, for different style of riding and, and different types of courses, you can put the trainer on to the controllable trainer mode and ride around in Zwift or whatever. And uh, the beauty is you can take turns and stuff throughout the, the environment to simulate the types of terrains that you're going to have. There's going to be some really steep climbs. And then I'll build that into like a VO2 max workout. So maybe I'll do, uh, there's one pathway on Swift that'll take me about 20 minutes and has a steep climb in there. And I'll do a VO2 max interval up the climb, very hard out of the saddle, 450 watts. And then I'll take a little bit of recovery and then I'll do the next basically 15 minutes down in time trial position at more 70.3 race pace. And then I'll repeat that three times through. And for me, once again, that kind of simulates two things. It can simulate a more technical bike course, a more, I guess, hilly bike course like St. George, mm-hmm. where you will have those big punches for three minutes or so, and then more steady 70.3. But also, even in a race like this, where you're uh, catching groups of guys and stuff, you need to be able to put forth that 450 watt three minute surge and go right back down into 70.3 nice steady effort so uh, you can you can use the terrain in the virtual world to, to simulate all that stuff which once again I don't have hills where I live it would be impossible to create that yeah. workout where I live yeah. so it's another one of the beauties so uh, that's, that's a couple of the ways that I use it and do you have a, a least favorite session which I imagine for you is probably ends up being your favorite session because you, you turn it yeah, around but, totally. but, but what, what is your, your least favorite session my least favorite session is the high end one minute two minute three minute Okay. style intervals and uh, I trained with a guy back in college who he was a great uh, miler and 800 meter runner and uh, I was more of the endurance guy so we'd do two workouts together a week and he would write one I'd write the other so his would always be 800 repeats 400 repeats I would just absolutely dread them and then he'd come to my session we'd do like 10k threshold run yeah. and and I mean that's a, that's a good strategy actually is to train with a guy who has the exact opposite strengths as you and you both hate each other but you both love each other as well do you how how close to your outside position is it with your head because you know if you do a lot of time on turbo it's easy to sort of get find a more comfortable position yeah. indoors than it is outdoors because you don't have to see where you're going and how do you make sure that you train those muscles it's as well it's a really interesting question i've just discovered it actually this year that that there is a significant difference between indoor position and outdoor position that you would choose because of the force of moving you have you have lift forces when you're riding outside significant lift forces and so the pressure on your groin and everything is significantly different outside than inside so you will choose self select a much different position yeah. inside than outside and it's a question I don't really have the answer to. The, the, where, I'm, where I'm headed is I think I'll develop two seat posts, two, two seats completely set up, my indoor post with, with the seat set up a particular way on my outdoor, and a very similar idea to you know, doing different lifts for different, on the same muscle group, but different lifts, right? A hammer curl, this type of curl, blah, blah, blah. Um, you recruit the muscles slightly differently. So I'll have my indoor position, my indoor, which will be just slightly different. I find like five millimeters higher seat posts, maybe seat a little bit further back when I go outside, probably due to lift forces. 
Uh, and so I'll train on that position on the indoor. And then when I go outside, I'll put the different seat post in and train on that outside. And this is all just theories right now. Uh, but that, that's something I just started to realize when I really did. I, I set mirrors up all around the bike so that I could start to analyze my position. And I mean, I, I, the, the process that I've been going through is it just it starts with, am I comfortable? And the next piece is, am I pushing good power? And the next piece is, how do I look? Okay. And, and it's just this, this, I guess, process of doing that over and over again. Yeah. Uh, and I still haven't come to any conclusions. I, I'm definitely getting better, um, but but it's still big, big work in progress. So it'll be, it's a whole frontier yeah. to explore moving forward. And what would you recommend to you know to age groups and to our viewers with with their position that you've you've learned from that? What would you say to someone who's getting onto the turbo for maybe the first time? How do they work out and get their setup as close to outdoors as as in? Yeah, as in I mean the number one thing once again is is uh, the, you're going to get the best at riding a bike while riding a bike. So you should probably set your position up in the beginning anyway as comfortable as you can get it yeah. so that you want to ride your bike, and then you can slowly as you do, adapt to that very comfortable position maybe you can take a couple spacers out on the front end if you need to maybe you can lift the seat put a get into a little more aggressive and just slowly this idea that like everything happens overnight just get rid of that like it's like you know you're going to spend years developing this if you're doing it properly and and you'll get into progressively more aggressive position and be able to handle it and uh and yeah, I think that's the proper way, not just like throw yourself into this ridiculous position. And then on the topic of, of neck and that sort of thing, yeah, definitely uh, you want to get a, a particular stand or something for your iPad to put it very similar to where you will be looking on the road. That's very important actually for when you're time trialing. If you got it, because I used to do that exact thing, I would set the thing up yeah, so I'd be so in this like relaxed. perfect position, yeah. yeah, that I could never do outside because I'll crash into something. <laughs> So if you're if you're really concerned, especially on your race pace kind of intervals, you definitely want to have that iPad set up right where you're going to be looking outside to get the proper adaptation. Awesome. Well, Lionel, thank you so much for that. Some really interesting insights and I'm sure a lot of points that people can take away. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. And if you want to catch all of our videos from GTN, just hit the globe to subscribe. And if you want some tips on how to ride a hilly triathlon course, Mark's made a video on that just here. And if you want to learn to pedal like a pro, which I should probably watch this video, you should click here.